for 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I don't recall ever having any kind of vote. Do you think that Bitcoin is actually defunding wars? In my time in Iraq, I really saw what they talk about, the unbanked, where they have no way to really save money. There was no banking system. And this is after the wars, where the whole place was just destroyed. Everything was destroyed. People were living day to day, in some cases, hour to hour. Bitcoin could bring a free market competition to nation states. You can't just steal someone's Bitcoin unless you have their seed phrase. So violence isn't going to persuade people to just give up their, their seed phrase and take it away from them, or it can't be confiscated by a third party. It's your way of protecting yourself, protecting your family, and hopefully developing hope for the future. If we have something backed by Bitcoin, I think it takes the power out of politicians' hands where they can do whatever they want without representation of people. Early construction in the US, a lot of the buildings that were built in the 40s and 50s are still standing, but the ones that are being built now fall apart so quickly. If I'm looking at these prices, like this is ridiculous. I'm paying this much for bread and eggs and milk. Like I feel for the families who are barely getting by. You wrote me in the preparation that you uh, saw firsthand in Arek what mm -hmm. unbanked means. Yes. And first of all, like what did you saw there? What was the experience there? And then let's get into this whole thing with uh, wars and, and unbanked and uh, what Bitcoin can do. Yeah. So I read, um, I think it was Alex Gladstein's book, the um, Check Your Financial Privilege. And among many of the other books, right? Bitcoin uh, standard, fiat standard, I mean, broken money could go on and on and on. And what you hear a lot of times, especially in the United States, is there's no use case, which I, I fully disagree with. And I, th I think some of that comes down to, you know, in the United States, we all have banks. We a lot of you know, credit cards, banks, there's a savings technology that we kind of use. Uh, in my time in Iraq, I really saw what they talk about, the in unbanked, where they have no way to really save money. There was no banking system. Um, and this is after the wars. There's during the wars and kind of afterwards, right, where the whole place was just destroyed. Everything was destroyed. People were living day to day, in some cases, hour to hour. And there was really no hope for saving money or using money that wasn't going to be easily confiscated by, you know, a criminal element, whether it's just theft itself or through any kind of insurgency or local terrorist group or whatever the case was. And so any money we were putting in to try to help the community would, you know, could easily have been confiscated by um, leaders, warlords, and kind of leave the people themselves to have nothing. And, and from what I've found was if you don't have hope for a future, you don't have a way to save and help your family, what do you do? Um, and, and having Bitcoin where you have, you can be your own bank, you can secure your own funds. And like Max Kaiser has mentioned, it's, it's the a peaceful revolution because you can't just steal someone's Bitcoin unless you have their seed phrase, right? So violence isn't going to persuade people to just give up their, their seed phrase and take it away from them or it can't be confiscated by a third party. Um, it's, it's, it's your way of protecting yourself, protecting your family, and hopefully developing hope for the future where you can kind of secure your own future. You can secure your own business. You can secure your own wealth for your family um, long term. And I think, you know, that was something I noticed firsthand when survival was your only instinct going from day to day to feed your family uh, and you have no income, you have no employment because there's no jobs, everything is destroyed. What do you do? And, and survival takes over instead of looking forward to, you know, developing your long-term wealth or even just taking care of your family on the long term and passing that on to them. Yeah. And even like uh, when we come to those topics where we have uh, sound money and low time preference money, we have like, I don't know, like the, the best shitcoin in the world is uh, probably the Swiss franc. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And and they live a little bit longer. Like the, it, it seems like they're not that hectic. They're a little bit 
uh, more forward thinking. Uh, and uh, I mean, you can also make the argument that the US dollar is the best, best shit mm -hmm. coin in the world. It depends on, on how, how you define it and how you look at it. Um, but it's, it's really interesting for me to, to, to look at those. And then when we look at countries where we have high inflation over 100% or closer to 200% with like Turkey, Argentina, all of the, oh, Argentina, I think got a little bit better like right yeah. now, but they still have <laughs> really high inflation in, in general. Uh, and there's so many places, oh, Lebanon was also an, an, a great example. Um, there are so many examples of that where when we have all of a sudden really broken money, and I love the book from Lynn Alden, by the way, yeah. I, I really hope to, to have her on the podcast at some point because her book was really, really good about broken money. Uh, when we have broken money, this makes something with society. This does something with your brain. This does something with with your behavior, and this changes something. How do you how do you see that when when we have like when we imagine now a Bitcoin standard where war is? Or like first, let's go there. Like, uh, do you think uh, that Bitcoin is actually defunding wars and and can actually? Um, stop or limit wars in certain extents? I, I think it's a great point. And I, and I think part of that, it, it, you know, it's difficult to say without seeing it in practice, but with fiat where you can continuously just print money and feed what I would call forever war. Um, I, th I think Bitcoin could stop that or at least mitigate it the best possible because I'll be honest with you, as we're going through and as these wars go on, a lot of times in just my experience, a lot of it was, you know, we are told something and we feel patriotic and we're like, we need to be a part of this to try to solve this. But then as you go through it, and this is from my point of view, right, um, you start to realize, like, well, what are we doing? Like, what is the what is the end state that we're trying to achieve here? Are we trying to stay here forever? Was was there a is there a goal to all of this? You know, are we trying to nation build are we trying to you know lib you know what are we trying to do and it, it seemed like somewhere a lot of that got lost and it, and it just continued to be well we're just going to continue to print money to continue funding it and it, it kind of threw me off because I'm, I'm looking at this and you know we were 20 years or so in iraq and afghanistan and i don't recall ever having any kind of vote you know do we raise taxes to continue supporting this do we you know, we're in all this inflation to support these wars. I'm like, I don't know how much money went into funding these, um, but I'm sure it's in the trillions. And I, I feel like and you can apply this to probably anywhere around the world. If there was a vote on raising taxes and they called it, I don't know, the whatever war tax, and there was a vote, I, I would imagine that the majority of people or a certain percentage of the people at least wouldn't vote for that tax. You know, what is this money going toward? Why are we doing this? Okay. If we're going to do this, what, what is our goal? What is the end state? What, what identifies a point where we have achieved whatever the, the goal is and how do we transition out? What is the plan? Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, maybe at first they'd be like all in because of the patriotic and they're like, hey, this is the right thing to do. But I think as longer it goes and I could tell you as anyone who's ever been to war, the vast majority of us do not like war. The losing your friends, losing family members, the scene of destruction that occurs on all sides. Uh, so it's hard for me sometimes when I, when I hear people who are calling for war and continuous bombings and everything else and the, the lives lost, the children, the families, having seen that firsthand, it's, it's really, it's hard for me to accept that people are so like war hungry at times. Um, I think they take the, I think they take the big picture of losses that occur um, for granted. Like they throw numbers out there, like it's no big deal. Like, you're like, Oh, well they've lost, you know, 30,000 people. That's, that's 30,000 people who have been killed, right? Um, or, you know, and, and I think and from, from my point of view, it's been we haven't in the United States, you know, haven't seen that many casualties. And we, we lost 5,000 or so, a little bit, 6,000 soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, it, and in the numbers wise, it's significantly less than like World War II, right? Or even Vietnam. But for someone who's lived through it, 
that's like 5,000 of my friends and families and the wives and husbands and children who won't see their, their family again. And that, that's hard to, that's hard to deal with. And so I am somebody who looks at it and says, Hey, have we looked at every possible way to solve something diplomatically before we go into and try to initiate a war and the lives that can be lost because of this? And I think with Bitcoin, whenever it's, not something that can be just mass created. Doesn't matter how much time or energy you put into it, Bitcoin will still work like you say, TikTok next block. There's only going to be so much created. And if our if we have something backed by Bitcoin or is a Bitcoin is our legal tender, I think it takes the power out of politicians' hands where they can do whatever they want without representation of the people first having a have a voice in this system. Um, so I, I think that's where it could go, where it, it, it could be more of a peaceful revolution. Not saying there's never going to ever be a wars again, because I think that's it might be short sighted, because I think no matter what, there's always going to be conflict one way or another. But I think this is a way of potentially limiting it um, so that you don't have these wars in the last 20, 30 years um, and just continue to get funded. Yeah, and it's a great point because the. <sighs> When you have a war that's going on for a long time and you have a military intervention somewhere else or a war or whatever it's going on, um, you would assume that the populace, the general populace is standing behind the war. But on a fiat standard, that's not the case mm -hmm. because they can, like a small group of people can uh, decide if there is a war or not. And they don't have to ask the population if they even want to fight this. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Vladimir Putin did not ask uh, a, a vote for all the Russians. Oh, do you really want to fight mm -hmm. the Ukrainians for that? Uh, so there's like no vote for that. It's like a, a small group of people or maybe even like one person, depending on, on where you live, um, who just decides, oh, yeah, I want to make war right now. Yeah. Uh, and and this sometimes is even... Uh, profitable to do that and it yeah. makes it makes sense for for economic reasons and like that's this this not this is not good and when we flip that around and we are on a bitcoin standard or sound money standard everyone has to like the government has to uh agree like they have to get the votes and they have to get the taxes from the people if they don't get the taxes and they don't get the votes uh, other government could actually rise up inside mm -hmm. of the country and get um, better and more powerful who is against the wars and who is against the things like we bitcoin could bring uh, the free market competition to nation states which would be really interesting to see i have no clue how this looks that's why i always ask mm -hmm. <laughs> my guests because yeah. i myself have no clue what what those things but uh, it's, it's an interesting thought experiment yeah no and you know i would say the a lot of from what i've seen most people are just trying to like get by survive live their lives create a healthy you know good family life um save for the future and it, so like you said it's not it's not everyone in that in a certain country is feeling this way and supporting you know is the enemy of somebody else right um and, and they're all, majority of people are just good people who want to survive make a living and, and raise a family and i think with bitcoin too that that kind of what attracted me to it was obviously the decentralization of it um, you know it's unconfiscatable really but also the time preference aspect of it like what can we do to make our world better not just for us uh, it takes the selfishness out of it right like i i look at the, the bitcoin i have and you know and when it went up to like you know in the 70s uh, not too long ago in the on u.s dollar value uh, if everyone would oh sell it sell it you know but i that's not what i i'm looking at my, what I'm looking at is like, I have this and this is an asset that I plan on passing down to my kids and then hopefully they pass it down to their kids and the better the lifestyle they have and the more secure and the safer and just overall everything about their life. Like you see those pictures on the internet, right? With especially X where there's like a family and 
a beautiful farm and, you know, they're living a happy life and it's not really focused on immediate satisfaction, immediate gratification. It's focused on long-term support and development. And, you know, when that really caught my attention, you know, obviously I read Bitcoin Standard and that was great. But when I read Fiat Standard, that opened my eyes from everything from construction to healthcare to food to, you know, just everyday way of life. And I think that book, more than anything, helped me, you know, flip the switch to get away from the immediate gratification side to long term, long time preference. Um, how can we make the world better? How can we make the products better? How can we make agriculture? How can we make businesses? What can we do to make everything better for the long term? So I, I really, I really credit um, Saifedean a moose book, um, the Fiat Standard, for really flipping that switch uh, for me. Do you think that we often say like Bitcoin is a peaceful revolution? Mm -hmm. um, do you think it will be peaceful? It will be like we basically when we are spinning that thought further. I mean, there are different camps inside of Bitcoin. Uh, like the modern market sailor approach is like, oh, the US dollar and everything will still be there. We just have the option to also have this uh, this great uh, store of value. Uh, but there are also this uh, camp where it's like, oh, Bitcoin will actually strip the power completely away from the government and separate money from state and there will only be bitcoin and no other uh, fiat currencies uh, and then there are a lot of things in between there yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. but when we go in this direction where uh, in in both cases government will have less and less power depending on like how much less power they kind of probably fight for it they kind of will do something against it uh, or they will join it more and more as, as Salvador now does it so it's, it's interesting how the transition time will go but do you imagine the transition time being actually peaceful i think so in a so to term peaceful it could be you know how do we how do we want to define that right because i don't think i don't think um like physical violence and wars, but I think there will be significant pushback, whether it's through media, um, you know, the, the, the governments, you could say governments of the world, right? Because if it becomes like a world kind of tender, um, they're, they probably have a lot to lose unless they get in early on this and start, you know, stacking now. Right. Um, so I think there will be significant pushback. I think there'll be significant money, dedicated to making sure or making sure that if it does come, it is as delayed as possible um, to give them opportunities to still find footing in this. Um, so violently, I don't think so. I think through media and suppression, I think is definitely probably on the table. But I, I also think that, and I would go toward, so I read, also read uh, Brian DeMint's book, um, parallel the uh, unlocking the the social structure of Bitcoin. I think it's interesting to say that if we had a parallel kind of environment where, you know, you are able to kind of use the tender, either dollars or wherever your country's you know currency is, and Bitcoin, um, kind of at the same time. You, whatever you want to use, as long as it's, you're willing to accept it, I think that has a, probably a greater chance of especially in the next couple 10 or so years i think um i think for us to say that it's probably way too early and this is just my opinion to say that it'll be a, used as the global money exclusively i don't know if that will ever happen i'm not as informed or in the loop of people who who probably who are much more knowledgeable on that than i am um but i i do see a parallel where you, you could use either as a legal form of money as long as it's accepted. And what I've tried to do, even I started my own um, website where you can, you know, Bitcoin clothing. And this hat is not, I don't make this hat. This is a uh, Sergio Bermudez. He makes these Bitcoin hats. And this is obviously El Salvador and Bitcoin. Um, he lives in Miami and he makes, these are high quality hats he makes. But, um, so I have to give him a shout out there. But I, have my website and you can buy Bitcoin clothing. You can buy Bitcoin themed 
um, like phone cases or speakers. You can buy pretty much anything you can think of Bitcoin related uh, or just custom made stuff that you request from my store and we can make it as well. Uh, it doesn't have to be Bitcoin, but we accept Bitcoin as payment or we accept you know, dollar or whatever currency for your country, credit, we, we accept everything. And so I think a slower adoption where it be, just becomes another means of acceptance of, of money uh, to transact, I think is um, probably where we'll head the next couple of years. Um, but there's also pushback. And when I interviewed Brian uh, Demint about this too, was on one hand, you have those who think, spending and using it as tender. I mean, he makes the point, you know, the white paper was a peer to peer transaction. Right. Um, and then those who say you just buy and hold because why would you ever spend it? Because it's going to continue to grow in value. Uh, so there, to me, there's like two different camps. I don't know who's right. Um, but I think initially it's going to be more than likely kind of like a parallel growth is, is my opinion. I don't think that we we need to spend our Bitcoin to be successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, like there's there's the theoretical side of it, and there's the side of it that's ideology and and oh, of course I want to spend my Bitcoin. I only want to live on Bitcoin. But there's a practical side to it. Mm-hmm. I, for example, live in Austria. Every time I spend Bitcoin, I have to pay taxes, twenty seven percent. I'm not doing that. (laughs) So I rather earn my fiat, Mm -hmm. put aside that what I need for the month and the rest to put in Bitcoin. Don't touch my Bitcoin. Don't spend, uh, don't uh, pay taxes when I buy a coffee. I I, I say coffee, but I never drink a coffee, but you get my point. It's like whatever I buy, uh, I I don't uh, spend taxes on that because it's it's ridiculous to spend all those taxes on on, on what you spend. But if you live in El Salvador and you can pretty much spend everywhere your Bitcoin, it's not fully fledged. Like there are stores where they don't accept Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. You have to onboard them. It's it's not like there's 100% adoption. There's probably like 25 or 30% of adoption of merchants, depending on what area you live. But you can find all your vendors. Like you can find your haircutter and your Mm -hmm. grocery store where you can pay with Bitcoin. And then if you get also your salary in Bitcoin, then it's easy. Then you just live in Bitcoin and that's great. That's a, right. an amazing world, and I love to be there. Right. But and that's that's the thing. What Bitcoiners also do sometimes, they put their own values and their own beliefs on Bitcoin, and they're like, "Oh yes, I only eat meat. That's why you Bitcoiner also should only eat meat. I uh, spend my Bitcoin. That's why you also should." Uh, like Bitcoin is a very diverse and very broad group already, even mm-hmm. though we are so early and so small, um, uh, and uh, we should not like say like this is a Bitcoiner. Like there, there, there's no such a thing as a Bitcoiner. There's just right. Bitcoin and then you can hold it and then then you are a Bitcoiner. But yeah. we cannot define it. I see I see that sometimes that people are like, oh, you, why are you doing that? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I agree. And I think that, and, and for myself, I would say that maybe it's just through just my life experiences. I try not to put any expectations on anyone. Um, you know, how you live your life is how you live your life. Right. Uh, how you choose to spend your money, save your money, invest your money. Um, your opinion might be different than mine. Right. And and you could spread that across however many people like I, I interviewed my my cousin who has a pretty heavy investment background in finance and a degree uh, runs a part of a pretty big insurance company here. And we, we talked about diversification. And I know there's no second, there's no second best asset, right? <laughs> but I would, when I would talk to people about Bitcoin, I don't tell them go all in on Bitcoin. I feel that I, I tell them to research Bitcoin. I tell them to study Bitcoin and Bitcoin is different for everybody. Um, and there's, there's, I don't think there's any way that I will ever know everything there is to know about Bitcoin because Every day, it seems like there's something new coming out. Um, and, but I, I do recommend on my side, people research it. Because for a long time, 
you know, I, I don't remember when you got into Bitcoin overall, but I heard about it early, probably, I want to say 2012, 2013. And I, it didn't really register what it was being talked about. And a lot of that is my fault because I didn't do the research. Um, and then about five years ago, uh, I had some more free time on my hands. And I was like, I'm tired of not understanding what they're saying about Bitcoin mining. I'm tired of under not understanding about Bitcoin and period. Let me research it. And again, and that's when I found Bitcoin Standard and other resources and in the white paper, obviously. And then I started to read and I started to understand. And then I started to understand it as an asset class, um, the scarcity and how it's like the perfect money. Um, and I started to really research it before I put any money into it to begin with. I, I really tried to know it as best as I could. And then from there, I started small and then I, and then I started increasing more. And then obviously I looked like a genius early on and then it dropped significantly like about two years ago. So like to about 16,000, 15,000 and everyone thought I was crazy and that I made a big mistake and it was going to zero. But I, but the thing was, I believed in it because I under, I felt I had a good understanding of it. And, and so that's what I usually tell people to begin with is try understand it first. If you want to put some small amounts into it, great. But understand what you're doing first. And then when you see these dips in prices or you see this volatility, it almost means nothing to you because you know in the long run what we're looking at. Um, and, so, and so that's what I try to do with the people I know. Um, I don't try to, I think initially I tried to orange pill people. But then I got away from that and just started telling people to study it, gain some interest in it, and at least know something about what you hear about on the news that you understand what this is because it's coming. And it's, for me, almost impossible to orange pill people. It's like they have to have some interest in it. They have to have some pain or so something that they're like, oh yeah, I want to learn about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, and everyone will have this... Uh, the, the time when they're like, oh yeah, now I need to know about Bitcoin. I really have to study Bitcoin now. And this will come for different people at different times. Like uh, we, 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 <laughs> we, we have now uh, in America and it's, it's funny to see in, uh, in Europe because in Europe there is no, there is no, no politician uh, that is really popular and doing Bitcoin stuff. Mm -hmm. But in America, we now have, have Trump that really is, um, I, I want to be careful here because uh, he, he's not really a Bitcoiner. He just saw Bitcoin as an opportunity to get more voters, I think. I don't know how how really Bitcoiny he is and how actually he understands it. He understands the power of it and he understands the power of the community. Mm -hmm. uh, that's for sure. Uh, but I have no clue if he actually understands Bitcoin uh, to what extent. Like maybe he's really good on it, maybe not. I have, I have no clue. Uh, but the the thing that's uh, for sure, he understands that he has to be pro Bitcoin, and that's a major thing. Like when uh, the maybe future president of America, uh, the one of the candidates, is is feeling. Uh, almost obligated to speak positively about Bitcoin because he's uh, depending on the voters. This means the Bitcoiners are now uh, a big group. We're not a, a small group anymore. We're not like a, a niche thing. Because if we are like just like one, two percent of the population or something like, like really, or maybe even smaller than that, uh, he would not care for that. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we are having a big thing. And there's one thing that uh, someone brought up in the podcast once, um, when you have 4% of Bitcoin who are intolerant of not, of, of using Bitcoin, they, they want to use Bitcoin as a payment mm -hmm. method, as a store of value, then you kind of force it on the society because if one, when 4% are intolerant about it, this kind of forces everyone to kind of accept it, like the stores to accept it, the locals to accept it, uh, the politicians to talk positively about it. Like all, all those things are slowly coming in America. Unfortunately, I don't see it in Europe. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm a little bit envy of uh, Americans these days. <laughs> well, well, I think it's interesting. And you, you brought up a great point was uh, whether he know, has knowledge of it or not, whether 
whether he has it, Biden has it, or even a potential third party candidate of, um, which I think Robert F. Kennedy has a junior has a, has a, at least a basic understanding. And I know he, he made it public. He owns, um, several Bitcoin and his intent passes on to his family and stuff. But it, what I find interesting and, you know, just, just my own personal opinion, right. The, the way politics are, especially for us in a two party system for the, for the most part, you will have people who are going to vote for one side regardless. And you're going to have another side that votes for the other side, regardless, just because of their affiliation for the party. So there's that middle group who is, you know, we call them like undecided or independent. And how do you gain that small percentage? So if, if somebody's going to say, we're going to be very pro Bitcoin, if there's a 10%, does 6% go to this person and four go to this? And that 2% difference results in winning an election, then that's, that's very enticing. Um, for someone as they see that this is something that's important. And I would say you look at the success in El Salvador and how much, I I don't know if I, I would say I definitely didn't pay attention when uh, President Bukele first took office, but it was all over the news this time. And you had several U.S. politicians at the inauguration. So I think what he's been doing kind of caught the attention globally and then also with the Bitcoin ETFs uh, in our stock market, with all of our, you know, BlackRock and Vanguard and everything else, people who probably never would have invested in Bitcoin because of the wallets and transact, you know, all that stuff. Now they can go through their broker or do it themselves. And there's a lot of money that's been poured into these ETFs. So now you have the attention of a lot, you know, I would say people who've never been involved in any kind of Bitcoin purchases in the past and holding their coins now when you have big money like blackrock and and um arc and all the others who invested in this with etfs um i think that's a that's a big that's a big thing especially if you invested all that money in thank you you already made it halfway through the video and i'm really really grateful to have you here two things make this channel possible you as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel and another one is all the bitcoin brands that i partner up with like 21 bitcoin who support me from the very start and where i personally buy my bitcoin from with code robin you even get a discount when you buy bitcoin with them and now also bitbox bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistic. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video there are people now that are i don't know 80 years old 70 years old who are in retirement who have 1 million 20 million maybe 200 million uh net worth they are clients of uh blackrock or other big mm -hmm. investment firms uh and uh their advisor calls them i don't know once a quarter and says like hey Hey Bill, we have this this new Bitcoin thing. Uh, it's it's really exciting. It's that and that. It could be the new money. It's really innovative. Blah blah blah. And he's like, oh, okay, okay, I trust you. You have been with me so many years. Okay, let's put two percent in there. Right. And then all of a sudden, because of the one phone call, two million more in Bitcoin. And that happens every day. Yeah. And uh, and they have a, a really a big big incentive. Um, to grab the, the fees, to grab uh, the, the biggest market share of, of Bitcoin. So they are calling their clients, hey, like, invest like 1%, invest like 5%, and oh, that 5% yeah. will go over time and like, hey, maybe 10% should be in your portfolio. And yeah. then maybe that that uh, 80 or 70 year old guy was like, oh, maybe I should a little bit research about it. They're going on BlackRock, they see some things and they're like, oh, that's not enough. I want to see like a podcast, like, there, there are people that are like, oh, and then I was like, and then they call it like, oh, it's really good. Uh, can you invest like not 2%, can you invest 20%, mm -hmm. 30%, maybe 60%. So like, yeah. 
it makes sense over time. It 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 is it is a, a small process to the full adoption and to have all the big players in there. And that's why it's really important to have the ETF. Uh, I mean, it, it kind of was inevitable because uh, when, when you have such a great asset, of course, the big investment firms will all, also want mm -hmm. the share of the cake. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, but but this is what's happening. Like the big guys are coming now in, and the the big money inflows. We did not see till now. Like they already were big, like the inflows were good, but they also were offset with the GBDCs and stuff like that. But the really big thing are, are still coming. Like this needs, like even uh, MicroStrategy needed like six months mm -hmm. to, to really adopt it. Uh, it imagine uh, a company run not by a micro sailor who studies it and, and then goes on and, and like pushes in the company. How long does it take? Like two years, one year, three years? It, it mm -hmm. can take a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and even for family offices, there's like, oh, then the family has to discuss, then there's the advisors, then there's all the things, then they have to do the legal things. Like uh, the ETF makes a lot of things easier, but it's not like it, it takes time. Like lower your time preference and, and yeah. be, be in it. Make, make sure you benefit from Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, which can be hard for a company, right? Because especially if, if you if you're a registered company and you have stockholders and board members and you know you saw what happened with MicroStrategy, right? I mean, at at one point when it was like at sixteen thousand dollars, you know, everyone was kind of like, "Oh, he made the biggest mistake ever." Now, Michael Say looks like an absolute genius, right? And when you have someone like him, I think also as a when you see the success of MicroStrategy because of this because of his strategy the Bitcoin strategy, I, I think that's attractive, right? As other business leaders look and say, hey, what's, what is he doing? How can we emulate that and apply that to our own business? And where does this take us? And so I, I think someone like him is so important for the space because he's, he's putting his money where his mouth is, right? I mean, he's, he's the one who's taking, who's taking the biggest leap so far and he's been successful. Um, so yeah, I, th I think having him is just—it's so great for 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 the for the industry, for the community, uh, and Bitcoin overall. Definitely. Um, one more thing that just came up in my mind, uh, n nothing related to that, but I just really released a podcast about that topic uh, with someone, and it's it's on my mind now. It's how Bitcoin could actually stop wasteful thinking. When we think long term, and Bitcoin is and money is worth something, uh, and whenever you buy something, you know that uh, you just spent money, and if you did not spend the money, the money would be worth more in one month, in two months, in in one year. Yes, this completely eliminates wasteful behavior. Mm -hmm. And I heard a crazy statistics. I did not prove it till now. I, I have to I have to look it up uh, closer. So maybe I'm wrong with that statistic. But uh, I heard the statistic that 85% of all trash comes from the fashion industry, from huh. clothing and all that all, all that things. Huh. And I was like, that's that seems ridiculously high. Uh, like even 40% would be really high for me. But I know there are a lot of waste things. And then uh, uh, I researched a little bit and it's like one out of five clothing uh, items are going into trash before even they have been worn once. Wow. Because they have been ordered, nobody wants them, they're out of the collection, then they are thrown away. And wow. it's like, is that possible in a Bitcoin world? Is, is, is that a thing still when money is actually hard and we cannot throw it around uh, as easily? Yeah, I'm actually very interested in that, right? Because obviously you, you, we all know about the 10,000 10, Bitcoins for the pizza, right? That's the famous story. Um, and so that's, that goes on in history. But yeah, I mean, I think about that all the time. And, you know, Jack Maulers, he was, I listened to his podcast and he talked about how he's, all in on Bitcoin. So all, everything he has, he says he's, he's Bitcoin. And so everything he uses is Bitcoin. And so what he said was, and, and much like you said, right? Like it, the transacting in Bitcoin is a tax, right? Or in his case, if he, if he has to, so he'll use a credit card and then he'll transit transition that Bitcoin to fiat to pay off his credit card bill, right? 
and he said it makes him think, you know, do I go to this fabulous steak dinner that's three hundred dollars a plate, and or I could just go and go to the store and grab a ten dollar steak and make it myself because I'm still eating steak, but that three hundred dollars worth of or three hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin that I've spent on the steak instead maybe I spend ten dollars worth of Bitcoin in the steak. So it makes you think about your decisions and are you are you really putting that money there? And the same with clothing, right? Like a lot of the material might be cheap fabric. You know, if, if companies went to more durable fabric, durable materials and things that could last longer, um, you know, instead of buying new clothes, even though you don't really change anything, but they don't fade as much or they don't tear as easily, you know, do you build homes with more sturdy material because instead of, hey, it doesn't matter because in three years we're going to have to replace all of the outsiding of the home, we've got to replace the brick. But what if we build it more sturdy, better materials, and pull a lot more effort into that? And I, I would even say government spending. Do we, do we focus our programs on things that are getting results? And if they're not getting results, do we continue funding them or do we identify why those results aren't being achieved? and get people into those jobs who are going to achieve the desired results. So if I'm trying to solve something like, and I think recently it came up um, that there's like a, I think it was $6 billion was put into um, railroad tracks in California that only went like 600 meters. Well, where is that $6 billion that it only went 600 meters? Like what happened? You know, where, where are we finding fault? Um, is it the companies, the employers? Is it the material? Is it the bureaucracy to get anything achieved? You know, if something takes 10 years to get approved, do we really need to put all the money into having this bureaucracy to make sure, you know what I mean? Like, there's so many different things and wasteful, wasteful spending, wasting time that I think using Bitcoin um, will really achieve because you're 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 uh, and you, when you said it about the fabric and and, and clothing and everything else so I, you know we have are, are you familiar with amazon um like the and it's like an internet you can order clothing shoes you can order all this other stuff it's really big in the united states um and but there's a place where if it's a big warehouse where they'll sell those items that people just returned never wearing once and you can rebuy them at a repurchase them at a smaller at a discount. If the, people don't buy them, we're talking, I'm talking one little area we have in our neighbor on our area that has a giant warehouse full of clothing and shoes and everything else that were just tossed aside. Put that across the whole world. And so when you said that 85% of the trash is, is, is coming from that, I, I totally believe it. And if, if you knew that, that I'm spending this money on this item and I may never wear it and I'm going to throw it away. I'm not throwing away, you know, what's $30 in Bitcoin now? What's $30 in Bitcoin going to be 10 years from now? So you, you brought up a great point. So there is a warehouse where all the items that never have been touched, but they have been uh, returned uh, from Amazon and you can buy them there for like cheaper. Yeah, I think it's called Zappos is um, where they'll Zappos and others where it's like returning shoes. So if you order shoes, let's say they don't fit because you ordered them online, they don't fit. You return them and then they'll be resold elsewhere. And so as a one example, if that's if that's just a giant warehouse in the area I live, I can imagine if you just put that across the world, that's not even counting the items that are thrown away, um, the items that are just laying around like we have we've had three daughters and so we have a lot of uh girls clothes that we've collected over the years right just because we've been passing them down from kid to kid to kid and so now we're going to pass those on um to someone else to use them that way they don't just end up in a dump somewhere um that's just us so i can imagine if it's worldwide i don't doubt that number 85 percent of the waste is coming from the fashion industry it's it's fascinating. I I have to look it up if there's something like that in Austria or in, in the European Union. Probably there is some some better place because uh there's so much uh sending back from Amazon going on. Even even for me, like I, I 
and I have a room where there's like a window mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <laughs> it's like connected to the stairways. Uh, and whenever someone is in stairways, the lights are on and there's a bed in there. Uh, and, and it's like when you're lying in bed and in the middle of the night, someone goes on the stairways, all of a sudden your room is lit up. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. a, it's a really funny cons uh, construction, but I just like ordered like black things that I can put on the, on the For window sure. because uh, it, it, there's no fuel. I, I just like want to have the, the, the darkness in there. And the funny thing is uh, it, it did not fit nicely. So I had to send it back. And it, it's so easy. Like you just like order it and then, oh shit, it does not sound like you, you send it back like this. You don't even need a printer. You don't need a packaging thing because you can mm -hmm. just go to like 500 meters to like something, you give it and they do everything for you. Uh, and you get your full money back. You don't pay anything. And if it's so easy to give things back, um, you don't even really think of when you, when you buy it. Like, you're like, ah, it's Amazon. I just buy it. Mm -hmm. If it does not fit, if it does not is good, I just send it back. It's, right. it's, it's, it's kind of this, this, this fiat mentality. Like, ah, let's, let's just do it. And then like, if, if it, if it's not okay, we just throw it away. Uh, and yeah. uh, it's, it's interesting for me to think about that. No. Yeah. No, it, it, it is amazing. And again, I, I really credit the fiat standard for opening my eyes to a lot of that, and especially with the materials. And, um, you know, we look at early construction in the U S a lot of the buildings that were, that were built in the forties and fifties are still standing, but the ones that are being built now fall apart so quickly. It, it's, it's so wasteful. And that's just, you know, I can't even, that's just the United States. I mean, the history in Europe, right. I mean, that's, it, I can't even begin to imagine the some of the construction and architecture and everything else that's been there for hundreds of years thousands of years in some cases um so it just it, it's something that reading that book and if anyone hasn't read it i definitely recommend it um it, it, i would i would say it's a life-changing book because it really changes your perspective on a lot of things it's funny to see in in vienna it's it's really they are really beautiful and old buildings that are there for hundreds of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are these new glass and stone bricks that are really ugly, but they are new and modern. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know if I like it. <laughs> it's, 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 it it kind of looks really, really, really bad. Yeah. And I, I prefer like those old things. Even I'm here, like I, there's like a wooden thing. It, it creatures and scratches. And it's like, when I open the door, it's like, yeah. <laughs> and, but I love it. Yeah. It's old. It's, it's there for a long time and it's just have been a little bit renovated. And yeah. there's like all those small details on, on the doors. There's mm -hmm. this uh, high ceilings. It, it's really, uh, it, it gives you a good feeling uh, about it. I, I love it a lot. Another topic that I wanted to discuss with you is, um, because we are talking about fear and, and how, how, how those things are, uh, about zombie companies. You're aware that like, I, I feel like, uh, a lot of the companies that are now, uh, even in the S and P 500 and, uh, other, uh, great companies and big companies, they would not be around on that Bitcoin standard. I think we would, uh, get rid of a lot of water hat companies, a lot of water hat government. That's for sure. But also companies that are actually right now um so close to government that they are like getting feeded by the tax money even though they are not really uh government uh companies but then they are also like big companies because they have been there for so long uh, and money was cheap so they they kind of live on that so there's a lot of um i, ca I call it water hat companies uh, like they have a big water water hat management team mm -hmm. company thing uh, above that and they're really inefficient in, in the way they are, they're doing things, but they're there because money is cheap and they can get cheap credits and everything. Um, do, do you all think that the economy will actually shrink to its necessity and this, this might make us way better for the future and we just have to be in a degrowth phase maybe for a little while? Yeah, that's a, that's a really tough one because I've always felt that the people who are making money, right, the right way or not, right, like you said, some of those companies you described, the pressure on them to continue making money is very great. 
So whatever loopholes in any kind of laws that they can find or any ways that they can continue to make themselves wealthy and shareholders uh, wealthy, I think there, there's enough legal loopholes to really fix things right now, if that makes sense. Um, I think it's going to be really hard. I really do. And like one, for, as an example, right, um, we talk about here in the United States, they talked about increasing minimum wage. To, so that's great. The problem is I think it only works if the, the company or the organization is willing to not make as much profit. And so if you're not and you raise minimum wage, then you either are going to lay people off and fire them or you're going to drastically increase the prices. So if you, if you fire the people, then the product suffers because you have less people doing more work. If you increase the prices, but keep the people, you have less customers because they're not willing to pay that much money, assuming the businesses maintain the same profit margins. And so I, I think that is, I think that's probably our biggest challenge right now because we're trying to, and again, a majority of people are just trying to live their lives, earn money and raise their families. And I, I feel like some of these government programs that they, that they try to do to, to try to keep either people or businesses afloat, I think have some negative impacts. Um, so if they're hire, if they're, maybe they're firing people, so you increase the wages, but now you're not hiring as many people or you, you increased the wages, but now the prices of food's going up. And so you're not getting as many customers, which in then turns to, I'm going to have to fire people because I'm not getting as much customers. I mean, so unless, a, I think unless a company is willing to, um, accept smaller profit margins, I, I don't necessarily think it's going to change too quickly. Um, I, I think I, I would see more people, more businesses going under than getting better. This is a really great point here, because here we see an example of government intervening in the free market. And that what you just described is very correct. And there's another aspect to it that is been overlooking at sometimes because when you increase minimum wage, honestly, Amazon does not have a problem with that. Apple mm -hmm. does not have a problem with that. Uh, all the really big and profitable companies, they don't have a problem like increasing the, the few people that are, they are employing on a minimum wage mm -hmm. because all the software developers, they have big management, they have the big, they, they are not, not <laughs> they are not on a minimum yeah. wage anyways. Yeah. And the few people who have minimum wage, they are smaller part of their budget. Okay. Then they have maybe 0.2% less profits. Uh, they increase the price somewhere else. They, they don't even notice it. But the thing that happens, uh, this really um, makes the startups and the small businesses and the small and business, uh, small and medium-sized businesses suffer a lot. Mm -hmm. and that's what's happening. When you increase the barrier to hire someone, yep. this does not affect Amazon, Apple. Right. This affects the small local business, the small restaurant that is then being replaced by a restaurant chain who has the bigger budget. And yeah. that's a really bad thing to have. Like that, that like whenever the government tries to <laughs> get into the free market to do something for the small people, mm -hmm. they mess it up for the small people and do good for the uh, big people. It's it's always the same thing. They, they try to do it the same uh, with the income tax. This was the, the same why they, they, they had the income tax. Uh, they're doing the same way with like uh, printing money, helicopter money. They're giving it to the poor people, but the poor people spend it on Amazon. They, <laughs> there was the saying uh, in 2020, um, they printed so much money that Jeff Bezos got retired. <laughs> like, <laughs> he got so much money that, that Jeff Bezos said like, yeah. okay, I have so much money. I have yeah. to do something with my life. Now I cannot be the CEO of Amazon anymore. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, uh, it's, it's just ridiculous to see. And, uh, it's, uh, I, I hope that we have a Bitcoin standard and get yeah. some, in, uh, some sanity back in, in, in the system. Yeah, no, it's like, we. You know, you described like the corporatization of the world where the, the, you know, for us, like the Walmart, the Apple, the Amazon, 
the giant companies. So all your local businesses, all your local economy is gone. And now everyone's shopping at these super centers. There's these gigantic nationwide corporations or worldwide corporations. And so, like you said, like you, you try, they pass policies that are intended maybe to help people. And in the end, end up hurting the, the, the middle class and, and lower class. And it's hard. It's hard to watch. Um, it really is. I, I, you see it happening and, you know, I'm, I financially, I'm fine. But when I go to a, a store, even though I have nothing to worry about, I come from lower middle class and I, I understand the impact of people who don't have money to spend on food. And so, you know, if, if I'm looking at these prices, like this is ridiculous, I'm paying this much for bread and eggs and milk and I'm okay. Like I feel for the families who are barely getting by. And then on top of that, what kind of lifestyle, what kind of health do those people have? Because, you know, especially with obesity and I don't know how it is in, in Europe, but you know, obesity is, to me looks like a problem here in the United States. I mean, I could be wrong, but it looks like a, a problem and it's easy to say, Oh, there's a problem. Eat. Yeah. <laughs> you, you need to eat better. You need to eat healthier and be more active. But I will tell you some of the time for the lower middle class people, like, the unhealthy food is really all they can afford. And so I don't, I don't, like you said, I, I, I don't like seeing it. It makes, makes me sad to see that. Um, I would like to see a more healthier population of people who can afford the food, who can afford things um, and get back to a, maybe a smaller um, local kind of standard of, of doing business. Uh, this is, uh, it's, it's very true. Yeah. Uh, obesity is definitely a problem. <laughs> Uh, I think I think more in America than uh, than in Europe, but as always, Europeans uh, adopting the American trends, so we are also adopting the obesity, definitely. So you'll catch up <laughs> soon. <laughs> we, we, we will catch up soon. Uh, the 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 Americans uh, adopted the internet uh, uh, faster than us, and they adopted obesity faster than us. But we are catch <laughs> we are catching up. We are catching up. They are also in front with the Bitcoin. So <laughs> it, it, we will we will we will be there. We will be more fat. Uh, don't you worry. <laughs> okay, counting on it. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, yeah, it's like. Uh, if, the richness in food is really cool in, in Europe. Like uh, you have Austrian food, then you have the Italian food, the French food. Like there's really a lot of culture in that food. Mm -hmm. And I also see now when you go to those countries, there are still those really local, uh, really local restaurants, but the trend is already starting. This, this, mm -hmm. uh, oh, there's McDonald's, Burger mm -hmm. King. I, I talked with an American in the Bitcoin Prague conference. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he, he was, it's so, so funny. Yeah. Like you, you travel around the world, like you, you, you fly eight, nine, 10 hours across the ocean yeah. just to go to McDonald's yeah. <laughs> and to the same one that you have in America also. <laughs> it's true. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in Germany near, uh, Wiesbaden area and I ate in a local community and that was a different experience. I mean, it was, it was more natural food um it was not you know i didn't eat at any chain american restaurants or anything like that so that was it was it was great and then my mother-in-law um so she's from mexico originally uh lives in california but now she's she's been with us for the last couple of years and she makes more traditional mexican food so a lot of like vegetables um a lot of like lean meat and chickens and stuff like that and so that's primarily been our, our family's diet has been more natural foods and not processed. And, you know, it's at the point now where if when you go to a fast food restaurant or you eat, you know, we call it fried food or junk food, eat, you don't feel very well. You know, it's eating that natural food. It's just your body feels so much better. And, um, and so I, I have to, I owe her all credit because, uh, she, she does all the shopping and gets the food for us and cooks for us and truly really amazing. But, you know, had I been eating a, a junk food diet or anything else, I, I could imagine what kind of life I would have. I mean, it's just the health just drops significantly based off of the food you eat. 
And it's so easy to go to some takeout shop and like I work a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I work out also a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. it, there's not a lot of time left in my day to cook, yeah. but I cook every day mm -hmm. because I know there's one thing in my life I cannot get back. It's my yeah. health. Like when yeah. I screw up my health, that's it. Like that's yeah. over. I like I, I know that there could be a point where I get some disease uh, and it's just like I just had bad luck. Mm -hmm. there, there's those things. There's all those things like you can go in front of the door and the bus runs over you, bad luck. Right. But there is a lot of things that you can control in your health and you should control it and you should eat good. Not that you get like to 200 years old, mm -hmm. but that your life gets better right now. Yes. And when I eat good food, if I work out, if I get enough sleep, the day, the next day is better. It's not like, oh yeah, I do that. Uh, so I can have a nice retirement when I'm 80 years old and I, I'm, I'm still active. I will mm -hmm. be still active because I'm healthy, uh, but I'm doing that for even now and for tomorrow and for in, in uh, 80 years. But that's the, that's the thing that uh, people don't get about health. It's right now better. If, if you only eat uh, McDonald's, if you only eat uh, junk food, your life sucks from this day onwards <laughs> because oh, yeah. it's not doing good for your body. Yeah, well, that goes back to, you know, the Bitcoin and the, the time preference, right? Instead of that immediate satisfaction of that, that junk food that might taste great, you know, the next day you're going to feel terrible. And what's that going to do to you down the road? And I've worked so hard on my fitness and my health. Do I want to throw it away by doing this or binge drinking alcohol all day and all night and partying all day and all night? And, and you know, that it just goes back to, I think, at least the people I follow on like X and other channels, the Bitcoiners, for the most part, are generally healthy or promote a healthy lifestyle. And I think that is, I think it's pretty cool to be part of a community like that. You just have to go to Bitcoin Prague or to Bitcoin Nashville mm -hmm. uh, when you when you are there, uh, and you see an amazing group of people. Mm -hmm. They are healthy. They're working out. Of course, they're also uh, uh, people that are a little overweight. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not everyone in the Bitcoin community no, is 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 fit and perfect and everything, uh, and doesn't have to be like that. But the overall consensus is that. If you understand Bitcoin from a first principles perspectives, you understand that the only thing more valuable in, in, in your life than Bitcoin is your time. And in mm -hmm. time, I, because I made a post and, and people are like, oh no, there's family, friends and love and everything. I consider that time, like yeah. t time with your family, time with your friends, time with, with your love, uh, time for yourself. Like this is the only thing that's more valuable than Bitcoin. And when you get the value proposition of Bitcoin, you're more likely to get the out of things and you value your time more. And, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, we, we, we talked about it long now. I think we, we have at home the point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and it's, and it's really important to, 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 to take care of yourself. Uh, I feel like, um, we are already, uh, I was surprised, like we are already at the over one hour mark. Um, wow. I would uh, just uh, go into end routine now uh, if, if you don't want to add, add anything, but you can add it afterwards. Um, and the end routine is, for the, the first question of the end routine is for every guest the same question. And it is, what are you currently passionate about besides Bitcoin? So, as, so I'm retiring um, from the military here shortly. So I've really put a lot of my passion into and it's been there before, but my real passion is my family. Um, I've been spending as much time with my children as possible. Um, there's a lot of time that I missed out due to deployments to Iraq and training missions in the Army. And so there's a lot that I missed that I'll never get back. And I realized that a couple of years ago, which is why I decided to retire, was there are moments that I've missed with my first two daughters, like their first words, their first steps all those things. And so I'm really trying to catch up for lost time. Um, so being with them, being with them to their sports, their activities, and being as present as possible in their lives is, is really my passion. And also supporting my wife who has supported me all these years. Um, she's a nurse practitioner. And so supporting her as she continues her career 
um, and, and being as supportive for her as she was for me over these 20 years almost. I love it a lot. And it's fascinating for me how much, how many Bitcoiners are bringing family at this point in, in, in the conversation uh, uh, with, with, uh, with the passion. Uh, I love that a lot about the Bitcoin community. Um, before, uh, uh, now we come to the actual end routine. Um, and this is the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Okay. Uh, and it's an interesting one. Um, what are you doing to relax and calm down? Um, so I like to be active. I like to exercise. I like to be outside, walk my dog. Um, I like to jog take my kids and be outside with them. They they're big soccer players. Um, so they are football, right? Uh, so I like to get them as involved as possible. They do a lot of, uh, traveling all over the country to play soccer. And so just being outside with them, being active and living as healthy of a life as possible. I love it. Very cool. Um, before I let you go, where can people uh, find you? Where can people learn more about you and, and ask you questions? Yeah. So you can find me on X at Bitcoin Mav one. Um, you can DM me, you can post to me, whatever. Um, I have my own podcast on YouTube at combat to commerce. And the intent with that is to help military people transition from the military to civilian lifestyle um, interview entrepreneurs and also, uh, Bitcoiners, um, as we say, no, no shit coiners. So if you're a big in the ETH or anything like that, no, thank you. But we are uh, Bitcoin only and had a, quite a few Bitcoin guests on so far who've, who, uh, are really helping introduce people to it. My, my focus isn't Bitcoiners, you know, Bitcoin passionate people specifically. It's, a group of people who have not really, who don't know and understand or are kind of interested in getting into Bitcoin. So it's maybe a little different audience um, than some, um, but it is my way of trying to get more people to understand it. Amazing. I love it. Thank you for, for your contribution in the Bitcoin community. I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you also for, for being part of my show and for, for being on and for everyone watching and listening. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.